But I think the answer is to say he's the one that started all of this. So, more or less the father of, of modern financial econometrics. That might be an oxymoron. I could probably just say financial econometrics. Um, and he's made contributions in all of the areas that we're talking about today. Um, from truly the first volatility models, um, empirical options, market microstructure. I think of him a lot for his covariance modeling. That's some of the stuff that we've gotten to do together. Um, and now, most recently, very influential um, in the field of thinking about measuring systemic risk. So he's, of course, the 2003 Nobel laureate. He's the Michael Armolino professor at NYU. And I'm very honored to have him give our keynote speech. So I'll not take any more of your time. Rob, floor is yours. Well, thanks, Brian. It's, it's great to be here. I, I, I spent a little while trying to think about what I should talk about. And uh, so rather than come up with a clear answer to that, I, I decided that I should talk about more than one thing. And this is one of the things I'm going to talk about, the prospects for global financial stability, which is, you know, sounds important. Uh, this is a picture of a lake which is nice and still and calm, but we're, uh, we're wondering what it's going to look like in, in other times. And so that's kind of what's motivating this. But actually, there are uh, two other things I want to talk about. I want to talk about what we're seeing in uh, VLAB volatility now, because, well, it's pretty interesting. There are, there's a lot going on. And then I want to talk about a new approach to estimating vast correlation matrices. So I'm thinking that I'm just going to give you a little peek at each of these topics. And they uh, relate in some ways, but in other ways they're, they're separate. So, so let's, let's start with VLAB. What is VLAB? VLAB is a website. It stands for Volatility Laboratory. It's a website where we gather data in, from all the financial markets around the world as soon as they close, uh, measure volatilities and correlations and systemic risk and stuff like that and post it on the internet. And uh, one of the things we uh, see when you first open it is a, is a map of the world, which basically is colored based on what the, uh, what the volatility looks like in this country relative to what it's been in the past. So I'm going to uh, show you this map. But, um, well, there's, of course, a lot behind it. What, what kind of volatility models are we putting in this? Well, these are actually the familiar asymmetric Garch models. But we have, if you dig in there, we've got about 15 different volatility models that you can look at and see whether they're all saying the same sorts of things or different kinds of things uh, over time. And we've got, well, I'm going to show you stocks, but we've got all sorts of assets in here. We've got commodities and fixed income and CDS and currencies, real estate, and a bunch of other things that, uh, also are shown in the same sort of format. So here's a little practice run. This is June 8th, uh, last summer. And you can see that the world is pretty much green. That means that the volatility for most of these uh, countries, the of their markets is, is low relative to their historical averages. And actually, if, you, if I had a mouse here run over, you could see sort of what the fraction, what the quantile of, of past volatilities look like. Um, if you look a little later on June 28th, which is two days after uh, Brexit, you see the world that turned red. And it's especially red in, in Europe, but U.S. was red, Canada was pretty red, a lot of Latin America was pretty red, Australia, Japan. Big volatility after Brexit. How long did it last? Well, there's actually a little slider up on the top there. You can actually go back and 
forward uh, just by running that button around. And so by July 10th, it was still pretty volatile in, in Europe, but a lot of the other countries were not. Actually, the intrig one of the intriguing things here is that you know, Russia and China didn't show much effect. Uh, most of the rest of the world did. So, uh, and then by the end of August, we're all green again. So, the fallout from Brexit was relatively strong, but temporary. That doesn't mean that prices didn't change, but they stabilized at their new values. Okay, so, how about here? Well, here's election day. So, this was the day of the election, and you can see that we're mm, sort of green, gray, something like that, in most parts of the world. That was, uh, I guess that was Tuesday. That was the prediction for Tuesday. Um, then on November 10th, which is the day after the election, we had, let's see, November 10th, that was yesterday. Today's the 11th, right? So this was the November, mor yesterday morning in my hotel room, I looked to see what this looked like. And basically, it doesn't look like Brexit. It looks pretty, pretty much green. There is sort of uh, some uh, reddish tinge in Mexico. Australia is red, Japan is red, the Philippines, uh, New Zealand, but it's not that dramatic. Um, now this morning, I looked again, and I'm going to go to, uh, to the live website, and one of the things you see that's changed since yesterday is that we have a lot of red in Latin America, and Mexico has basically turned red. You see these effects are, uh, seem to be actually accumulating in, in some, of the, some of these countries. And so, for example, if you look at Mexico, you see its, its volatility is 82% of it. It's the 82nd quantile of its historical volatility. So it's, it's pretty high. In the U.S., 31%. So we're below the median. In, and we can follow these things all around. You notice now, a lot of these countries that we have been trying to set up trade partnerships with are Indonesia, that's 80%, Philippines, 78%, Japan, 89%. Uh, I don't know whether, let's see, Myanmar, I don't know whether Myanmar is in, in this or not. Anyway, you know, it's, it's an interesting picture to look at. If you, um, oh, sorry, I need to go back. Um, I don't need that. If you click on, say, the United States, and this was yesterday, you can see where these quantiles lie for different industries. Uh, these are sectors on, on the left, and the little button tells you you know, where we are relative to quantiles in each of these sectors. On the right-hand side is sort of the broad-based indices. And, uh, and actually, one of the interesting numbers, I think, is what is the average volatility of all the stocks that are actually in VLAB, which is, I don't know, several thousand for the U.S.? Well, it's 37%. We don't actually usually know quite what that number is because we look at the volatility of indices, which is, of course, much lower. But the average stock has, has a, a pretty high uh, volatility. <coughs> and if you click on any one of these, you can see even more details. And one of the details I thought was interesting is to look at the, uh, the XLF, which is the financial market. Yes? So I'm actually a bit surprised that that's how responsive the cost estimates are to the events. Because I feel like uh, usually cost models you take a long period to estimate the parameters and then make a forecast about volatility. I'm very surprised to see that there will be a response right after the Brexit or something like that. Yeah, it's, well, you, it's, uh, you put a, 
as, as we all know, the, it's basically got declining weights on past squared returns so that the, the, the day which has the biggest impact is the most recent day. And, but the alpha that we get in, in the Garch model is a, is a small number. So it says, you know, you take yesterday's return and you multiply it by something like, uh, you know, 0.1 or something like that, and that's what gets into the volatility right away. So you're, you're right about that, but in fact, you do see it. And if you look at pictures like this, um, you see what happens over time. So the uh, the red curve is the uh, is the the GJR Garch volatility prediction for the XL uh, XLF, and you can see Brexit very clearly there. You can see what a big jump there is after that one day's move in the U.S. bank prices. And then plotted on here is also the VIX, and you see that the effect of Brexit decayed pretty fast, uh, and was uh, basically the XLF volatility was pretty low leading up into the election, and then it's actually gone up, but it's gone up, interestingly, because of positive returns in XLF, uh, just over the last day. You can see, actually, if you look at the bottom down here, you can see the last two returns were both big positive returns, and that is the green line is the level, and you can just see that it's, it's shot up. So we've had a big positive news for the banks uh, since since the election. Okay, so. That's kind of the, the fun current events, or at least that's the volatility part of it. Um, and now I want to show you this, what I think is potentially an interesting uh, statistical way of modeling large covariance matrices. Um, we can when we look at options, we tend to think that we're only interested in small covariance matrices, but when we're looking at any kind of a portfolio strategy, especially options portfolio strategies, you're likely to have big portfolios of, of strategies that have a little bit of an alpha in each one, and you're trying to put those into a portfolio. So I, I thought it, it might be interesting to this group. So this is a paper that I've done with uh, uh, Olivier Ledois and Michael Wolf, and it's called Large Dynamic Covariance Matrices. So how big do we mean by big? Well, so if we're talking about portfolio construction or risk modeling, how many assets do we need? Well, typically, we might hold several hundred assets in a portfolio, but that's out of a out of thousands that are out there. So we might really need a thousand or more dimensional covariance matrix to select this portfolio, although maybe a smaller matrix would be enough to measure its risk. So how many correlations is this? Well, this is thousands <coughs> squared over two approximately, which is a whole lot of correlations. So we're talking about estimating a lot of stuff. And are these constant? In other words, do we just do this once or do we have to do this a lot? Well, it's not likely that these are constant. So that's why we want to do dynamic models. We want to do dynamic models of this kind of enormous size covariance matrix. How big are we used to doing this in, in, uh, in financial econometrics? Well, an awful lot of the correlation models we've done are bivariate models, um, well, we use the Dow sometimes. Well, that would be, you know, 28, 28 stocks, something like that. Sometimes we've used the S&P 100 or, or half of it, 50 stocks. It's pretty hard. So what are the challenges? So there are really, I suppose you could say three. One is managing the data itself. A second is how do you maximize criteria which are so 
ha have so many dimensions to them. And how do you find so many parameters that you can estimate this kind of a giant system? So the couple strategies that have been uh, used, and I'm going to show you an additional part of it. So first of all, we tend to use a relatively small number of dynamic parameters for the correlations, and many, but many parameters for the volatilities. So we treat the volatilities <coughs> separately from the correlations, so that you can, it turns out you can use a lot of parameters in the volatilities, because those are just n of those, and uh, if you have a small number of parameters for the correlations, that simplifies that. Uh, so rather than using maximum likelihood to estimate these kinds of systems, where you would end up inverting and taking determinants matrix over and over again, where we use composite likelihood function. So what is composite likelihood function? It's it's a QMLE estimator, that is, it's, you're maximizing something which isn't a likelihood function, but the optimum of it is what you want. And so a way to think about this is you take each of these binary problems that we know how to do, and instead of maximizing them one at a time, we add up the objective functions, and then we maximize that objective function. So it no longer has the big matrix in it, the big matrix is only inferred from from what you uh, what you do, uh, and it turns out that that is such an efficient estimator that you don't even need to use all the bivariate ones to get very uh, good results. Uh, one of the things is we can see immediately that there's a problem with uh, how much data you really are going to need, but in this kind of framework, it's should be clear that you're learning a lot from the cross-section. And since the cross-section can be pretty big, we can get excellent estimates of the dynamic parameters without um, going to uh, the fully efficient uh, maximum likelihood estimator. Um, and interestingly, of course, when we estimate a correlation normally, we only use bivariate information for that. So if we have a great big we want a great big covariance matrix. We can estimate all the little pieces of it and subsets and stuff without uh, without worrying about it. Okay, so that's an approach to improving the computational cost of doing this. But what I want to talk about today is the third piece on this slide, which is when you estimate these big models, it turns out most of the parameters and the most difficult parameters to estimate are the intercepts. So when you have an equation for each covariance, there's an intercept. And these intercepts have to have a relationship among each other so that they're all, it's positive definite. And there are basically n squared over two intercepts in the covariance matrix. So how do we estimate the intercepts? The, strategy that we typically use is what's called correlation targeting, where you do an, an auxiliary estimate of what the correlation matrix is, and then you tra treat that as if it's exact when you're doing the maximization. Uh, you can interpret this as a method of moments estimator, a GMM estimator, so that you use moment condition on the correlations, and then you estimate the, the, the dynamics separately. So, the problem now is how do you estimate a thousand dimensional correlation matrix? Well, that's not as easy as you might think. Uh, because it turns out that the sample correlation matrices are very <coughs> badly behaved. If you think about it for a second, there are basically, as I said, n squared over two uh, parameters to estimate in this matrix. And if the sample size is t, then there are t times n observations. So basically, you have you know t over n observations available for each each uh, parameter you're estimating. And so that's if t is 10 times bigger than the sample size, that's like 10 observations for each of these. We know that that's not a, that's not a large sample. That's a pretty small sample. And so 
there's these have a very easy to have bad uh, performance. So the solution to this often is to uh, shrink the estimators. And uh, Ledois and Wolf introduced a linear shrinkage estimator, which is pretty widely used. Uh, there's a paper with a cute name, Honey, I Shrunk the Covariance Matrix. And basically what they do is they take a, a weighted average of the sample co uh, covariance matrix or correlation matrix and the identity matrix and have an a, a algorithm that gives them uh, a way to optimize the weights in that, which is they use a Frobenius norm for this, which you might or might not think is a good idea. But anyway, that's how they get it. So what we're going to use here is actually a more sophisticated version, which they have recently come up with, which they call nonlinear shrinkage. And basically what it is, uh, based on random matrix theory, they have, uh, it's, I guess, well known that you get biases in the eigenvalues of sample covariance matrices, which have a particular form. That is, that the smallest eigenvalues tend to be too small, and the largest eigenvalues tend to be too big. On average, they're okay, but you get these small ones that are, are, are very small, so that the inverse of the matrix is badly behaved, and large ones, it looks like you've got just a small number of factors. So if you're doing principal components or something like that, it's going to look like you've got only a small number of principal components, but really, there are more than that. So um, they have introduced an approach to uh, estimating this, actually. Um, and essentially what it does is it says, this is my understanding, uh, is that you can, if you know what the true uh, distribution of the matrix is, and you take the limit as n and t both go to infinity with a, with a ratio, which is the limiting ratio, you can work out the biases in the eigenvalues. So if you, you have a, a distribution of eigenvalues that is the true distribution, you can work out what the distribution is biased toward. And this has this property that I just described. And if you can do that, then you can invert that distribution and take the sample eigenvalues and map them back into what the population would be by basically shrinking the largest ones and increasing the smallest ones. And that's basically what the strategy is, but it's, it's sort of complicated to implement. So this is now the DCC implementation of this, which uh, I'm not going to go through because some of you know it and others of you don't. And Neither of you will be improved by me going through it. <laughs> um, okay, so we need a loss function. And there is some discussion of, of uh, what the right loss function ought to be. And from a portfolio point of view, there's a, a nice way to think about it. We, can, we always can look at like the minimum variance portfolio, and, and that's something to look at because the minimum variance portfolio doesn't require knowing what expected returns are and so if you calculate the minimum variance portfolio with a, with a particular your favorite covariance matrix and then you have some experience with this portfolio you'll probably observe that its actual variance is a good bit bigger than your theoretical value for this minimum variance but it's also true that if you compare different estimated covariance matrices. The one that has the smallest minimum variance portfolio is the closest to the, the truth of, in this class of estimators. Well, you can generalize this for a much more interesting case, which is where you have a, a, vector, a hypothetical vector of expected returns, which might or might not be the true vector of expected returns. Uh, in that case, what we're going to do in the Markowitz world is we're going to minimize the variance of this portfolio subject to a required return estimate. And if we do this with a uh, bad covariance matrix estimator, we are going to end up with a more volatile return 
than if we do it with the good covariance matrix estimator. So we can compare the volatility of these even if the expected return vector isn't the true vector. So that's kind of what is done here. Uh, there's a, a generalization of this to the large sample uh, random matrix theory, which only involves looking at the, at the traces of these, these big matrices, but we don't need to talk about that. Okay, so first thing is to do a little Monte Carlo. So the Monte Carlo has here, in this case, is a, a DCC <coughs> estimator where we've done correlation targeting with three choices of coefficients. One is the sample correlation matrix, a second one is the linear shrinkage of Ledois and Wolf, and a third is the nonlinear shrinkage estimator. We do it for a sample of size 100, 500, and 1,000. And on the left, it's with normal we distribute random variables on the right is with t random variables and the sample size is 1250 so this is sort of a more or less real world sort of illustration but in any case uh, what you see is the uh, the loss <coughs> function that that I've I talked about here for each of these cases and what you, you see is when the ob 100 observations there is a benefit to the shrinkage, but it's not too dramatic. When you look at a thousand observations, the benefit to the shrinkage, especially the nonlinear shrinkage, is, is very dramatic. And that's the, the goal here. Um, so now let's take a look at actual real data. So let's look at, at the, uh, the Russell 1000, and let's look, first of all, at the global minimum variance portfolio. And we're going to add an, one more additional portfolio here, the uh, equal weighted portfolio, or 1 over n. We'll add that to the DCC with the sample covariance matrix, the DCC with a linear shrinkage, and the DCC with a nonlinear shrinkage. So for each of the sample sizes now on the left-hand side, and this the data is from uh, 1986 to 2015, for each of the sample sizes, we've calculated the average uh, return, the standard deviation of the, this is a portfolio return, the standard deviation of the portfolio return, and the information ratio, the sharp ratio of the portfolio return. Since we're looking at the minimum variance portfolio, we really should only be interested in the standard deviation of the return, and that's the middle row. So as you see, for a sample of 100 observations, the smallest variance, smallest standard deviation is the, uh, the nonlinear shrinkage. That's also true for 500 and it's also true for 1,000. So there is clearly a benefit to this shrinkage estimator, especially relative to the 1 over n, but also relative to the other, the sample and the, uh, the linear shrinkage. Finally, Let's look at a, uh, a more real-world example. Suppose you have a signal, like a momentum signal, and you want to use that as your expected return model and use this kind of shrinkage estimator to choose your portfolio. So now we might be interested in the, the average return as well as the information ratio and the standard deviation of the portfolio. So, Probably we would argue that the information ratio might be a summary statistic of what, what you'd like to have happen. But of course, it might be that the signal is not a very good signal, in which case we might not be so interested in, in the average return or the information ratio. It might just be the standard deviation. So we have them all here. And once again, the standard deviation is minimized for the nonlinear shrinkage. But it turns out also the information ratio is maximized for the nonlinear shrinkage. And uh, so the signal looks like it might have some value uh, in this case. But this is really just an illustration. And there are, you know, you, lots of people can do this with their own preferable signals as to what's going on. So 
this is a, an interesting strategy, I think, to, to construct fairly useful and not too complicated covariance matrices for very large sizes. And I, I'm not really sure whether a thousand is, is a, you know, any kind of a limit. It, it was designed for the Russell thousand and, you know, but at least the DCC part can go bigger. The version of this uh, uh, shrinkage estimator, I think, is one of the limits for this. But of course, you don't have to do that every day. That's, a, that's like a one-time estimate of the constant part of the covariance matrix. And then the dynamic part would, would be changing at, over time. OK. That's topic two. <laughs> OK, now. I want to do one more thing, and uh, this is I want to look at systemic risk. Um, and this is the, uh, the risk in the banking system that we see around the world, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about you know, what recent events might have done to this. This is, again, going to use volatility models, and it's going to use correlation models, but we're not going to have to do a thousand by thousand correlation, we're just going to do small ones. So we don't have to do the shrinkage part, but it's the same technology uh, without shrinking. So the uh, regulatory challenge that we, uh, we got from uh, Dot Frank, and, but had of course long before that, is we want to ensure that financial institutions have sufficient capital so they can not only survive a financial crisis, but continue to intermediate and provide financial services to the real economy. Okay. Good regulation is prevention, not rescue. Okay. Uh, you know, all these things probably are going to have question marks pretty soon, but in any case, it seemed to me this was, this was, uh, this is the regulatory agenda. And this is the critique. Are we uh, solving the next crisis or the last crisis? Anyway, so what I'm going to compute is uh, a measure called S-risk, stands for systemic risk, which is an estimated answer to this question. How much capital would a financial institution need to raise in order to function normally if we have another financial crisis? So the regulatory challenge would be to get this number to zero. So they don't have to raise money in a financial crisis. And if they have to raise a lot of money in a financial crisis, then the chances are they can't really do this with, without public help. And that's why we see this as a systemic crisis, uh, if, if the S risk is really high. OK, so how do we do this? Well, uh, is, this is a little accounting thing. What we're interested in is the capital shortfall conditional on a counterfactual, which is we have a crisis. Capital shortfall is how much capital they have to raise, and it's a random variable. We're going to look at the median of it in, in this case. So what is the capital shortfall? It's the difference between the amount of capital uh, they, we think they should have and the amount of capital we expect that they would have conditional on a crisis. That is, if you think that the capital ratio in a crisis should be at least this little k, then little k times the assets of the firm, that is the debt plus the equity, should be uh, less than or equal to the equity they have, in which case the S risk would be negative. Well, if it's more than the equity they have, then they will need to raise it, and that's how much they would need to raise. So we're going to try to estimate that, and the key, of course, is to estimate what the equity, what the market cap of this financial institution is likely to be in the event that we have another crisis. Um, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to basically do it with uh, the uh, security market regression, that is, look at the, how the return on equity on the individual stock depends on the return on a global market index. And if we think that there is a crisis, then we think the global market index is going to go down a certain amount. 
and the beta measures the impact on the firm. In fact, since these are large amounts, we need to, uh, to worry about whether, so we're going to think about a 40% decline in the global equity market. If the beta is really two, it's 80% decline for this, for this market cap for this firm, except that we've taken using a lot of returns with as a fraction here, so for large numbers we have to adjust for that, and that's where this exponential comes from. But the secret sauce here is the beta. Where do we get the beta? The beta is not a constant over time. The beta is changing over time. And we're going to use a, uh, a measure of beta that comes from the same uh, dynamic way of estimating volatilities and correlations. Um, so the S risk that we're going to get is, can be compared to a stress test. And we actually do compare it with the stress tests that the Fed does, the stress tests that come out of the ECB and the European Banking Association and, and the SIFI designations that come out of Basel. We get something pretty similar. So anyway, this is the uh, this is the equation that I just derived for you. But what I want to talk about is how to estimate uh, the beta. So we're going to use dynamic conditional beta. So let me tell you what that is. Uh, we're headed into new new territory, I guess, <laughs> something like that. Um, so the basic idea of the, of the beta is, I mean, we run regressions all the time without worrying about whether there's a dynamic beta there or whether it's a constant beta, but implicitly we're assuming that it's constant. And if it's a hedge ratio you're computing, we're assuming it's constant. So if it's not constant, what would we see and how can we, how can we decide whether it actually ought to be or not? Um, so. Um, most of the methods that we have in place for dealing with non-constant betas are sort of statistically and logically in, uh, inadequate to the problem. The most common thing to do is do a rolling regression. But the rolling regression is statistically a problem because we're making assumptions that for each sample interval, the beta is really constant, and then you move one day or a month ahead, and then it's constant again, and that's a, those are different assumptions. Furthermore, the amount you roll depends, tells you exactly how much volatility there could be in the beta. You, you shouldn't have to do that ahead of time. You should have that be an outcome of your estimation method. So basically, we're going to use the theory of in the practice of multivariate volatility estimation to tell us how the betas move. And so here's the basic idea, and it's, it's a totally, it's a one-line proof for what I'm going to do. That is, suppose you think y is a dependent variable, that's the return on the stock for this particular company, x are the independent variables, and that might be just the, the global market return. These two random variables have a joint distribution which has perhaps time varying intercept and time varying covariance matrix. In that case, we can work out, if it happens to be normal, we can actually analytically work out what the solution is. If it's not normal, then it's a little more complicated. We can write down the distribution of y given x and the past as this kind of expression, which you've probably seen before, and the coefficient of x is what we call beta. So what is the coefficient of x? Well, it's, uh, it's the covariance matrix of x inverted times the covariance matrix between x and y, which is almost exactly the formula you learned in your first econometrics class for least squares, x prime x inverse x prime y. What's different about it, it's got a t subscript on it, and what that means is this is the prediction that you would make before t of what that covariance matrix would be on date t. So the beta t that's written here 
is a function only of the past. There's no current information in it, but it's your predicted beta for tomorrow, for the next day. And that's exactly what we want to have in this model because we don't want to know just what the betas were in the past. We want to know what they're going to be in the future if we have this uh, financial crisis. Okay, so uh, how do you know that you're not just getting noise from this procedure? We use multivariate volatility models, but that, they're not necessarily correct models. So this leads to nonlinear, uh, non-nested testing hypothesis non-nested testing models, and there are a lot of different strategies, but the one that I like, and I think it's very intuitive, and that is used in what I'm going to show you in a second here, is the notion of an artificially nested hypothesis. That is, it's a model that includes both constant beta and time-varying beta as special cases. And this is not a model that anybody's ever seen before, because it's created just for this purpose. And so now you can think about regressing y on x and having the coefficient be the constant part of beta, and also x times beta t, which is the beta that comes out of the dynamic conditional beta, times another coefficient, which we call phi. And so if theta is equal to 0, it's all dynamic conditional beta. The betas are moving just as we said with the multivariate Gartner model. If phi is zero, it's a constant beta model, and the beta t that we've estimated is all just treated as noise. And if both theta and phi are significantly different from zero, then there's a question about exactly what you do, and what I'm going to do is just use the predicted, the, the, the uh, use this model as if it is really the model. That is, theta hat plus phi hat times beta t is what I'm going to use as beta. So you could think about this as a shrinkage estimator for the beta, too. Because if beta is noisy, then phi is going to be a good bit less than 1. It's going to attenuate the fluctuations in beta. If beta is really accurate, then phi is going to be pretty close to 1, and theta should be pretty close to 0. And we're going to use whatever comes out of this, because it is actually giving us a regression coefficient. It's a complicated regression coefficient now on the variable we're interested in. So that's, OK, so let's see what we get. So here's what it looks like for Bank America. And what you see is, well, we know betas on average across stocks have to be around one, and you can see for Bank of America, on average, I suppose, over the last decade and a half, it's been around one. But you see, during the financial crisis, it went up dramatically to maybe around three. So that says if the global financial markets went down 40%, which is more or less what they did, Bank of America stock would go to zero, or at least something very close to that which it also did. Uh, and then if you look subsequent to that, you see another rise during the European sovereign debt crisis. And then uh, more recently, it's been sort of jiggling around and jiggling around. But it's, it's sort of hovering around maybe one and a quarter, something like that. If you look at Goldman, you can see it didn't respond nearly so much to the financial crisis. Why is that? Well, Goldman was not in the business of mortgage-backed securities. When, when the economy was doing badly during the financial crisis, it was really linked to a lot of the lines of business that Citi was doing, but not the business so much that Goldman was doing. So the market responded by raising the, the beta of, uh, of city. Um, but you see also that Goldman on average was, is a little bit more risky than, than uh, city. If you look at Wells Fargo, you see it increased They're big in the, in the mortgage market during the financial crisis, but not as much as, as city did, and came back down and has basically been pretty stable. And this recent around the, their 
they're uh, creating customer account, fraudulent customer accounts doesn't seem to show up here, but that really wouldn't, you wouldn't think of that as a systematic uh, effect anyway. Okay, how about European banks? Here's Paribas. And you can see it didn't respond very much to the financial, our financial crisis, but it really did to the European debt crisis. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. And you see right at the end, there's a big jump up in BNP Paribas. That's Brexit. So we see that the beta for BNP Paribas went up over uh, two and a half in the immediate aftermath of Brexit, but it has come back down again. Deutsche Bank, well, you can see its beta is at the end of this period, or almost at the end of this period, about as high as it has been over the whole historical period. And that, uh, Deutsche, I think it looks to a lot of people, looked to a lot of people that Deutsche Bank was very serious trouble, and if the economy got worse, it would get worse a lot faster. And Barclays, well, you can really see Brexit there. Uh, it's very dramatic. So what do we see when we look at these numbers? We're now going to do that. We update this every week, and we aggregate primarily over countries so that you can see how much the, the expected capital shortfall would be for each country should we have another financial crisis. So here is world risk. So if we have another financial crisis, this is how much capital it would take, we think, to bail out all the financial institutions in the world. And it's, uh, you know, three and a half, three and a quarter trillion dollars, something like that. Which is a big number, but it's not outrageous. It's, uh, you know, it's more or less the foreign exchange reserves of China. So I, I like the quip that, uh, you know, China could bail out all the banks in the world if they were in so inclined. But, uh, and you also see that at the peak of the financial crisis, it was more than that. It was probably four trillion. Not that much more, though, interestingly. Where is this? Well, if you look at across countries, it turns out that China and Japan are the two largest right now. They have the, the, the biggest uh, systemic risk, followed by UK, US, France, Canada, Germany, Italy, Spain, Korea, India, Switzerland, Australia, and so forth. But it's possible that we should be looking at these relative to the capacity to rescue the financial institution should it be necessary. So maybe we should look at these relative to GDP. So here is what you see if you look at it relative to GDP. And as you can see, Japan now, it's about 15% of GDP is what it would need to bail out its financial system. This is a big number. Uh, UK is 12%. That's a big number too. France. 11%, you know, if we're talking about taking 11% of GDP and putting it into your financial system, we're talking about a serious, a, a serious problem. Um, so regulators seeing these numbers are obviously concerned that they're not going to be sent this invoice. Uh, well, how about in the U.S.? Well, in the U.S., actually, things are getting better. They've been, we're now down to about just over uh, 300 billion. And in fact, before the financial crisis started, we were maybe at something like that. So we're kind of back pretty much to where, where we were at the beginning with the, uh, I would say, probably help of Dodd-Frank and the careful scrutiny on, on these on these financial institutions. Now, these numbers are from the beginning of the month. Um, and I suspect they've changed. And I think we'll find out on the weekend. We calculate, we update these every weekend. So I think on the weekend, we'll see probably these numbers will actually start, will look even better. 
because the bank shares have gone up, that's going to make it look like the banks are better capitalized. And so one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is, are they? Or do they just look like this? So is the stock market, can we count on the stock market to give a fair valuation, or, or are we talking about sentiment and, and emotion or something like that, which is not actually measuring value? Well, obviously, you know, we can't exact, fully answer that question. But I think an interpretation of this is that the, the Trump economic plan is actually going to lower costs for these banks. It's going to uh, increase the value of their assets. And it's probably going to increase the risk, but the risk premium should be taken account of by the market. Whether it's effectively done or not is kind of the question. So I think it's possible that we would say that the Trump economic plan as it's, as it's conceived of by the investors is going to actually strengthen the financial structure in the U.S. Um, so here's, here are the companies. We've got Bank America, Citigroup on the top, then MetLife, number three. MetLife is an insurance company. Then we have JP Morgan, then we have Prudential, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, then Lincoln National, Principal Financial, Genworth Financial, Hartford Financial. So we have all these insurance companies in the top, top echelon of systemic risk in the U.S. And this is actually one of the things that the OFR has been concerned about and, and we have been concerned about because insurance companies actually have S risk that's been increasing while the banks have been decreasing. Insurance companies have not faced the same kinds of regulatory changes that the banks have faced, and they have faced a tough financial environment because interest rates are so low. Uh, that's, of course, another thing. We've seen interest rates come up the last two days. That's good for banks. It's also going to be good for insurance companies. So here's the bad news. This is what you see if you look at Asia over the last decade. You see it had very little systemic risk during the financial crisis, and it's been increasing linearly, pretty much almost a straight line, except for the uh, Chinese stock market bubble that temporarily reduced it. So that, I think, I could spend an hour talking about China, but that is really a concern. Everybody talks about the debt load in China, but this is a kind of a picture of it that is, is dramatic. How about Europe? Well, Europe, things are getting better, but it's not really back anywhere close to where it was before the financial crisis. And, and this uh, little peak here that was uh, Brexit, was uh, fairly temporary, I guess. Um, you know, the top top countries are the UK, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, and so forth. So, what is the future supposed to look like? These are my uh, my grandsons looking out over the lake to see whether whether there's going to be a storm or something like that. And um, you know, we worry about it for them. I don't think they worry too much. But, <laughs> but uh, what do we think? Where are the risks to financial stability? I think the top of the list is Asia, and there are, as I say, there are lots of, lots of things going on there, and I don't think we're going to have a financial crash the way we did, you know, in the U.S., but I think it's, the financial system is likely to be headed for some kind of stagnation where, where we just have debt overhang and no no impetus to uh, clean it up. Next is Europe, and basically global slow growth is a big concern because it, it makes it hard for banks to be profitable and, uh, and strengthen their balance sheets, so they're all struggling, and uh, you know, to some extent, fairly successfully. Um, so this is the growth exp express, which seems to have stalled. We've had lots of talk about that, 
both before the election and, uh, and in the campaign itself. And, you know, I think actually what we might, I, my opinion as to what, how to read all this literature is that monetary policy has sort of done what it can do. It can't really do much more. We really have to talk about fiscal policy. And if you think about fiscal policy that increases growth, then that's going to pay for itself. So maybe we should think about fiscal policy that raises the marginal product of capital. Maybe we should think about, which is basically why there's all this talk about infrastructure, education, structural forms, and so forth. I don't think trade restrictions are going to do this. And that's kind of, you know, I feel like we're lumping apples and oranges into this uh, political agenda. And I, I, I hate to see trade restrictions be put in the same category as infrastructure. So that's the problem. And I think it wouldn't be bad if we uh, reminded ourselves what Keynes said. He called our monetary policy the liquidity trap interest rates are so low that you can't force people to borrow. Fiscal policy worked for a while in the US, and then we stopped using it and raised taxes and slipped back into, the, into a depression again, and really only pulled out of the Great Depression with World War II. So I ask a lot of people, is there a better way than a war? Do we need World War III in order to get out of this, this global stagnation? And my challenge to all policymakers is let's come up with a better idea. And if you think about, you know, debt versus war, you got, <coughs> let's, let's have a little expansionary fiscal policy. It seems to me that's what we got. Anyway. I'm done, thank you. <laughs>